uh, thank you for uh, coming to our second uh, seminar of the semester. It's a great pleasure to have here Dr. Zapor from uh, UC Berkeley, from the Electrical Engineering Department, and uh, she, where she has the Video and Image Processing Lab. And uh, Dr. Zapor uh, got her, her BS from Caltech and her MS and PhD from MIT in 1987. In 94, she joined the ECS department at UC Berkeley. Uh, Dr. Zahor is very well uh, known for her work on uh, the video compression and many other things. And uh, she received several awards, including the General Motors uh, Scholarship, the Harry Ford Engineering Award, the Hertz Fellowship, and many, many others. And uh, others that she got as a more senior she got the Presidential Young Investigator Award and the Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award and many, many Best Papers Awards. And uh, she's obviously had a very illustrious uh, career and still has a very illustrious career. It's a pleasure to have her here today. And thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Feel free to interrupt and ask questions as I, as I talk. So today I'm going to talk about fast, automatic, photorealistic 3D modeling of uh, building interiors. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the staff member, John Kwa, and uh, a long list of students, uh, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, who have uh, helped me do all the things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so roughly speaking, the outline of my talk is as follows. I'll, I'll tell you uh, exactly what problem I'm trying to solve. And as you'll see, the uh, two main components of the problem are localization and model construction. Then I talk about some applications and future work. Uh, I want to start uh, by spending two minutes or very few minutes to talk about earlier project in my group from about 2000 to 2005 on 3D outdoor modeling rather than indoor modeling. Uh, so the basic idea there was to uh, uh, drive around a truck equipped with laser scanners, cameras, and other sensors uh, on, under normal traffic conditions on the streets of Berkeley, for example, and using those uh, automatically build a, a ground-based model, uh, and then fly uh, helicopters and airplanes and collect aerial laser data as well as aerial um, pictures in two different runs and build an aerial model, and then register and fuse the ground-based model and the aerial model together in order to come up with a 3D city model. Uh, so here's a picture of, for example, Google Earth looking at downtown Berkeley. It's just a picture. It's flat with nothing on it. And after we insert our 3D models, it looks something like this. So this is before and this is after. Uh, again, this is another uh, view of downtown Berkeley. You can see everything is uh, smooshed and flattened, uh, like here in the middle. You can see the shadows of the building. And after we put the 3D models in, it looks like this. Uh, so this work was actually licensed by Google in 2007 to become part of t 3D Google Earth. And uh, some of the buildings that you see in major cities in the U.S. in Google Earth, like New York City, San Francisco, the 3D versions of those come, are, are derivative of this work. So let me just uh, also, while I'm at it, show you a quick uh, uh, video of that work. Um, so the goal was to be able to do interactive uh, fly-throughs and walk-throughs. So this is a four by, can we turn the lights off perhaps in this room? Yeah. Okay, because of that's fine. Yeah. So here's a uh, four by four block of downtown Berkeley. Uh, we're looking at it aerially, we're doing aerial uh, fly-through and then we pick a point on the ground, come down, uh, look around um, the buildings to the right, to the left, um, and you can see the upper portion of these buildings was, uh, was texture mapped with aerial and the lower portions with, with ground-based. Uh, on and on and on. So um, once, once this was transferred to Google, we switched to indoor modeling. Um, and let me, while I'm at it, show yet another video. Uh, I think this would uh, summarize uh, things quickly. Teachers at UC Berkeley have developed a laser backpack that can scan its surroundings and then create an instant 3D model. It's technology that can make video games more realistic and buildings more energy efficient. Richard Hart reports on the drive to discover a new model of everything around us. Uh, here's a model of two floors of Quarry Hall. This, this is the first model of an existing building made without human intervention. It is the work of a Cal Berkeley team led by Professor Avide Zakor. 
Grad student Nicholas Corso dons a backpack brimming with lasers and cameras. As he hikes the hall, the lasers scan floor to ceiling and the cameras capture a panorama. The idea is you wear a backpack, you walk inside the building, you're done, push a button, and out comes this model. A model textured with the photographs. This team is also behind technology that creates 3D views of major cities on Google Earth. Why not fly into these buildings too? Well, the outdoor version relies on GPS. You can't rely on GPS indoors. So Professor Zakor's imaging lab combined a new breed of miniature laser with an inertial management unit like the one that guides missiles. That IMU localizes the backpack, lasers generate the geometry, and cameras generate the texture map. All three are fused for precise navigation. Once it's turned on, there are four cameras snapping pictures simultaneously. One looks left, one looks right, this one looks at the floor, and this one takes a picture of the ceiling. At the same time as this laser looks left, this laser looks right, this one looks at the floor, and this one looks at the ceiling. And up front, the most sophisticated analog component ever devised. With this, you can walk stairways and caves and places a robot just cannot roll. One day, you'll have a little pack of sensors in your belt, and as you walk inside buildings, you collect data. So every location, indoor and outdoor in the universe, will eventually be mapped, and we'll have it all online. So without ever going anywhere, you can see what everybody's interior looks like. With the next step in mapping, Richard Hart, ABC7 News. Very good. So um, let me uh, just start, start by stating the uh, goals and objectives um, of our project. We want to come up with the f uh, 3D fast automated photorealistic models of, uh, of building interiors. Uh, such that we can do virtual walkthroughs uh, and also fly, fly throughs inside buildings. Um, and, and kind of an ultimate goal after that is to be able to combine that with the outdoor modeling so that then you can uh, visualize exteriors and interiors and have kind of a uh, seamless transition in between the, do, between the two by, uh, by doing, for example, a walkthrough from exterior of a building into interior of a building. Uh, there's lots of applications that would need this, um, uh, virtual reality, gaming, entertainment, training and simulation, architecture, construction, real estate, first responders and emergency responders. You can imagine firefighters would want to know the 3D model of the building they, they're going into, including staircases before they go in it. Um, so th today's solutions primarily deal with indoor mapping rather than indoor modeling. Um, and, and, and what I'm trying to say is that they produce output, um, they output 2D maps, such as the one that's shown here, um, and uh, rather than complete three-dimensional three texture models. Uh, in addition, they um, use wheel devices, such as the one that's shown in the, in, in the corner here, um, and, and use, uh, which, which can move easily on even smooth surfaces. Uh, and, and the reason is that then the vehicle does not, acquisition vehicle does not exhibit too much pitch and roll, and you can use things like wheel odometry to, to uh, localize the vehicle and build the models. Uh, in contrast, uh, we're interested in developing a system that can work in areas with uneven surfaces, like staircases, caves, ramps, and other difficult situations. And we also want to generate complete 3D uh, textured, photorealistic model. We don't want to come up with just a point cloud or geometry. We want, we want to have nice alignment between our pictures and colors and textures with that geometry. So uh, our, our, our approach is the following. We want to use a human operator rather than a wheeled device. And the human operator is, is simple because we don't have to wait for robots that can climb stairs. And we don't have to work on problems like obstacle navi uh, avoidance and navigation and all those hard robotics problems. But at the same time, the human operator can go in lots of lots of places that are tight uh, and, and difficult to map. Um, the con op is you equip the, the backpack with a bunch of sensors, you walk around the building, collect the data, and then when you're done, um, uh, offline, press a button, and out comes the model. Um, so what are the challenges? First of all, because you have a human operator, there's weight and power limitations. Um, you, can't have, you can't ask the guy to carry something that weighs 200 pounds or 100 pounds or too much. Um, and unlike outdoor modeling, uh, there's no GP inside buildings, there's no GPS in order to help you get localized. And you'll see in a second why localization is an important problem to solve. Uh, and unlike the outdoor modeling approach that uh, I, we just finished in 2005, where we used aerial images to localize, 
there is no aerial image inside the buildings. We're, we're not even exploiting the floor plan for the buildings. We're assuming we know nothing about the building, and we're assuming we didn't equip it with any uh, access points or wireless networks or nothing. It's just a random unknown building. You don't know what's inside it. You, you want to go in, walk around, and come back and build a model off of it. And the other major challenge is that when you have a wheeled system, like a car or a truck like that's shown here, there's really, for localizing that vehicle, there's really just three degrees of freedom. It's movement in the X and Y direction, as well as rotation in the X, Y plane. Basically, what direction am I headed? That's called the yaw. And where am I in the X, Y plane? That's the three degrees of freedom if you were on a truck or, or, a, or something with a wheel. Uh, because a truck cannot roll over or pitch over. If it does, it's finished. It's gone. Uh, on the other hand, if you have an airplane, or even if you have a human, uh, because human uh, motion has associated gates with it, uh, there is there's quite a bit of non-zero pitch and roll, uh, that, and also Z movement. You might think that we don't, we don't have any Z movement because we don't fly in the air. Certainly we don't. But as we walk, there's slight Z up and down that, that we experience. So to solve this this localization problem, which will eventually lead us to build these models, we have to s solve a full six degrees of freedom pose estimation, X, Y, Z, yaw, pitch, roll. So here's a picture of the human operators, uh, two grad students um, uh, carrying the backpack with, uh, with the various sensors on it. Um, and here's a CAD diagram for the backpack, shown from two views. Um, so there's uh, three kinds of sensors in it. Uh, the sensors that start with the letter L uh, stand for laser, and the ones that start with the letter C stands for camera. So we have one, two, three, four, five uh, laser scanners, and for the lasers, H stands for horizontal, uh, and uh, V stands for vertical. Uh, and uh, for the cameras, L stands for left, and right stands for R. So this is the left camera, this is the right camera, this is the uh, vertical laser scanner, one, two, three, etc. Um, in, in addition to lasers and cameras, uh, we also have uh, what's called an orientation measurement system. It's a small, inner sense, um, um, relatively cheap uh, device that gives you, nominally gives you yaw, pitch, and roll. And you'll see in a second that the yaw values we get from it are not used. Um, and, and here is a laptop that collects all the data, and the laptop is attached to the, to the backpack. And in addition to all of what I just said, um, there's also a ground truth device. It's a high-end uh, uh, sensor from Honeywell. It's HG9900. It's a navig navigation grade IMU hooked up to an Aplanix computer that processes that. Um, and that device is very expensive, about half a million dollars, very heavy, consumes a lot of power, uh, but it gives us very accurate values of these six degrees of freedom we're after. However, it has one other drawback that prevents us from using it in, in the actual system we're trying to build. And that's really why we use it only for ground truth purposes. And that is for every minute or so that we walk, it requires you to zop, do a zero velocity update. It means you, you freeze for a minute uh, to, for it to correct the states of its Kalman filter, to reduce the errors. Uh, and then after that, the, the handheld device that goes with it says, you may now move. So you move for another I don't know, 45 seconds a minute, and this, you must do as up now. It, it talks to you. So every, for, every, for about every minute of walking, you've got to stop a minute. And so for, for many, so in, in, essentially for our application, it doubles the acquisition time. Plus it's very heavy, very expensive, power consuming, et cetera. So as a result, even though we have this, this unit, the HG9900, together with, with the computers uh, that process its data, we're really just using it as a ground truth in order to characterize the algorithms that we derive for our actual system. So one, one thing I should clarify is that these laser scanners are what we call 2D scanners. They scan in, in a plane. They're not three-dimensional scanners where they give you values of the three-dimensional scene. So a horizontal one gives you a, uh, it has a 270 degrees field of view and it sends pulses uh, along this direction, and it re re receives returns, and based on time of flight, it calculates how far things are. And so these, these little planes that you see here for the vertical scanners, they're showing you the, ver the, the plane associated with a vertical scan. So you can see that this, this vertical scanner to the right, LV2, uh, if, you're, if, if I'm showing here, it's, it's scanning the walls like that. Sorry, LV3, I said the wrong thing. LV3 here, you can see because of this, 
because of its, the circle that it operates is, is like this, it's scanning the floor, it is scanning the, the wall as I traverse parallel to the wall and to the right. And LV1 is, is giving me vertical scans on the left wall. Um, and uh, this, this guy, L, LS2, is, point, is scanning the ground, right? Uh, and, uh, and this guy, LV2, it's a pitch scanner. It's scanning ahead of me, right, in this direction. Is that clear to? Okay, very good. And this one, L LH1, is a horizontal scanner. It's scanning a plane like that. So I, I pretty much covered um, all the stuff in this um, slide. Just to mention, there's an external 170 watt hour lithium ion battery that also has to be carried to power all these sensors. Uh, so here's a simple uh, overview of the concept of operation. As I mentioned, to make 3D models, first you have to localize, and then you make models. Uh, what, are we, what do we mean by localize? We want to estimate position and orientation at each instant in time. That means we want to recover six degrees of freedom, x, y, z, yaw, pitch, roll, at each instant in time. And to do that, we use, as you'll see in a second, we'll use both horizontal and vertical laser scanners and the cameras. Uh, so once we localize the backpack, then we can generate the point cloud because then we can stack the vertical scans that, uh, for the right wall and the left wall just the right way in order to build the point cloud associated with the environment. So in other words, if we didn't know the pose of the backpack, we couldn't stack them properly. So this picture down here shows you this, the process of stacking the vertical scans just the right way in order to build the point cloud. Okay? And uh, to, to, so, so we, we use these other, a bunch of scanners and cameras to localize, and then we use the vertical right and left scanners that I just talked about in order to build the point cloud. And then from that point cloud, we can reconstruct the surface. Uh, and then uh, we use the cameras to texture map that surface in order to come up with a photorealistic model. So these are the kind of the four steps of, of, the, uh, uh, of the process. And here's a kind of a system diagram that summarizes that again. So we use uh, horizontal laser scanner one, vertical laser scanners two, and orientation measurement system to come up with what, what we call incremental localization, and that becomes clear in what, what, just a second. Uh, incremental means that we're getting the six degrees of freedom from one time instant to the next. It just gives you the delta between the, the oppose from one, one instant to the other. Uh, and then we go through this loop, this box, which does the loop closure, and it gives you what's called global localization in a, in, a, in a coordinate framework. It's telling you globally where you are at each instant in time. So you can imagine as you stack up the incrementals, it builds a global path. And then uh, you, you can figure out where you are at each instant in time. So the output of that is also a six degree of freedom. And to do that, we use both uh, LV3 and LV1. Um, then we generate the point cloud. Uh, and then we do surface reconstruction, and then we do texture mapping. So this step in the middle, the, the global uh, localization or the loop closure, uses not only laser scanners, but it also uses uh, ca right cameras and left cameras. So to begin with, I'm going to start talking about incremental localization. Uh, so the, the most popular uh, algorithm used for incremental localization is called ICP, Iterative Closest Point. How many of you have heard of it? OK, one or two. Um, so basically, if you have two scans, scan one and scan two, assuming that they're in the same plane, uh, what ICP does is tries to find the rotation and the translation in that plane that lines up these two scans together. And it does that by solving the minimization problem that's shown at the bottom here. Okay? Uh, it works well uh, if the scans are not too far apart from each other. They're more or less registered. That means R and T are fairly small. Um, and it also works well if the environment has rich 3D geometric features. If you're going down a hallway with absolutely no geometric features, just a blank wall with no indentations and protrusions on the wall, and you, your laser scans you're getting are just straight lines with not, no interesting things in it, you can't align them nicely. It becomes difficult to align. So here's a kind of a p picture of how ICP works. Suppose you have a scan at time t0, time, time 1. And it, because they're assuming they're in the same plane, you compute three degrees of freedom, the change in U, the change in V, and the change in angle that lines them up. And once they're lined up, that's the incremental change between scan one and scan two, between the scan at time zero and the scan at time one. Uh, so for our outdoor modeling, if you just uh, concatenated these scans, so we had a horizontal scanner on top of a car, uh, if, we just, um, if we just did successive scan matching on the horizontal scanners and received this uh, these vectors, two-dimensional vectors, and stack them up together, we get a path that's shown here. 
So just to illustrate this, this the, the background picture is the aerial laser scan of, of Berkeley. For example, this thing to the right here is the football stadium, right? And these dark, uh, long lines are streets of Berkeley, dark black lines. Uh, so the th things that are high up are brighter, uh, and the things that are low down and, and further away from the aerial laser are, are darker. So the streets are here, and as you can see, this, this red path that we've discovered or recovered doesn't align with the streets. Uh, in fact, as you can see, this red line crosses, jumps over the buildings and all that. So clearly it's erroneous, right? What I'm trying to show here is that if you just stack up these 2D scans, you get garbage because the errors accumulate. Each one has a little error, and you stack them up and concatenate them. Mm, big errors accumulate. And so what we did when we solved the outdoor uh, modeling problem uh, we use aerial images of, uh, in order to constrain that. We solved the Monte Carlo localization problem saying, look, the edge of the buildings shown in this aerial picture must line up with this horizontal scanner on the ground. So the aerial image and the ground data should be consistent with each other. I won't go into the details of it, but only to show that after we did that step, the, the, the path that we got was much nicer. It now lines up nicely with the streets, and visually it looks a lot more correct than what we had before. right? Uh, so the point is, if you, if you just run open loop and concatenate this, these things at, uh, at one after another, you get big errors. You have to correct it. OK, so how are we solving the indoor problem? Um, we not, not that initially, not, at least not that different from the outdoor. Uh, suppose you, this is a hallway. We're looking at, at the top down. And suppose this is a laser scanner that's doing a horizontal scan like this. Uh, so it, it hits the side wall, uh, this side wall and this other side wall, and this is the laser plan scot, uh, laser scan plot that we get out of it. Now, uh, as, as it rotates, we get a different laser scan. So if we just do scan matching across this horizontal uh, scan, we can recover x, y, and yaw. Uh, um, and if we just if we just repeat that, it might be my cell phone. No. Okay. I thought it might be my cell phone. Uh, so if, if you now, instead of having just one yaw scanner, if you now have a scanner that scans in the horizontal plane, a, a pitch scanner that scans in this uh, XZ plane, and, and a roll scan that scans in the, in the YZ plane, so you have three orthogonally mounted scans, you get these pictures. So what, what, what I'm showing here is the vertical scanner uh, pointing forward. Uh, it hits the ceiling and the floor, and that computes uh, pitch uh, uh, X and Z. Uh, and then uh, this is the yaw scanner that we just saw. It gives you x, y, and yaw. And if you do successive matching on the, um, on the roll scanner, this one, uh, which scans the side wall, the ceiling, and, and, and then you get y, z, and, and, and roll. Uh, so now you can concatenate all of these things, and you can get x, y, z, yaw, pitch, roll. Yes? So you're assuming there's no clutter. Uh, we're assuming, no, clutter is fine. Clutter is actually gives you geometric features. We're assuming that the clutter is not moving. So for that, we have to make sure nobody walks out of the bathrooms and walks into the hallway as we're scanning, or no moving parts. Because, uh, I mean, then there is a problem of distinguishing clutter versus real things, right? We don't, we don't care about that. Clutter gives us geometric features, and as long as clutter is in the same position before and after, that's OK. We're, we're, another thing we're assuming that I'm not saying is that we're assuming these scans are in the same plane. In other words, the, for example, the two successive roll uh, scan, uh, um, they fall into the same geometric pattern, so that successive scan. I, when, when I do roll scan matching, I'm assuming yaw and pitch is close to zero. When mm -hmm. I do yaw scan matching, I'm assuming pitch and roll is close to zero. Mm -hmm. And in reality, it might not be. As I said, the human motion has some gait. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So, so basically, what this slide is suggesting is that if you have three orthogonally mounted scanners, and, and uh, then you run this ICP algorithm three times, uh, you get all the parameters you want. Some of them you get twice, the x, y, and z. Each one you get twice. So this brings us to our simplest, most elementary incremental localization algorithm. It's called three times ICP. Uh, so what it does is it uses the top horizontal yaw scanner, this one, LH1, to give us delta x, delta y, yaw. And then it, it, it uses the side-looking vertical roll scanner, which is this one, sorry, this one, uh, in order to give us delta y, delta z, and delta rho. And it's delta because it's telling us the change in, in y and z and rho, not absolute y, not absolute z. Uh, and then uh, we have a side-looking uh, vertical pitch scanner here, 
um, that, uh, that gives us delta x, delta z, uh, delta pitch. Um, and, um, and that's it. Then, then we can con concatenate these things and have six degrees of freedom. And, um, and, uh, and we're done, right? Um, the next algorithm that's slightly more sophisticated than this is we call it 2 times ICP plus OMS. And the motivation for coming up with this algorithm is that the elementary 3 times ICP I just talked about is very erroneous. Uh, and, and the idea here is to say, let's not compute pitch and roll from successive scan matching. Uh, too many assumptions have to be held true, and, and doesn't, doesn't really uh, result in accurate answers. So um, w why don't we just use the, orient the, cheap, uh, IM, the cheap orientation measurement system that we have, uh, the, the, the InnerSense sensor, uh, to give us the pitch and roll? And you might be asking, well, why don't you get the yaw from that also? Well, the answer is that the yaw value coming from that sensor uh, is based on a magnetometer that's inside. And um, it looks at the Earth's magnetic field in order to figure out the heading, which direction you're headed at. And, uh, and when you're inside buildings, if you have uh, steel cabinets that distort a uh, magnetic field, the answers that you get off of it are pr pretty much garbage. So we, talk, we throw away that yaw values. We still compute the yaw value by matching successive yaw scans. But then for pitch and roll, we plug in the values from um, the inner sense. So uh, in this new setup, uh, again, we, we use the yaw scanner to give delta x, delta y, delta yaw. We use the inner sense OMS to give us delta roll and delta pitch. We still need to have z, so we can't completely get rid of ICP, uh, the second ICP algorithm altogether. So we use, for example, the side looking ver vertical laser scanners to do successive matching of those vertical scans. Uh, it gives us delta z plus, for example, the um, the pitch, but we throw away that pitch and just use the delta Z coming from this second ICP. So we run ICP twice, that's why it's called 2 times ICP, and then we use the inner sense OMS once, and that's called 2 times ICP plus OMS. And um, the uh, next algorithm, one degree more sophisticated, assumes that uh, we're on a planar surface. And it, this might sound like an oxymoron, because I started off the talk by saying we, we want to go into complex environments like caves and staircases. But I even when we're, let's say, mapping or modeling the Quarry Hall or, or the Electrical Engineering Building at Berkeley, we walk on a plane on the second floor. Then we go down the staircase. Then we walk on a plane on the third floor. So there are a good portion of our walks might be on planar surfaces. So, and it turns out that if you, take, if you detect that you're on a planar surface and you take advantage of that, you can have very low z values, e error in the z values that you compute. And so this is shown here. This is a uh, scan um, that hits the, the ground. This, this portion of the scan is hitting the floor, and this portion is hitting the ceiling. The ceiling, we're not assuming it's planar because it could be a dome or whatever. But most times, floors are planar. So if we detect that the floor is a plane, and you compute the slope of it, delta y over delta x, and we call it m. From m, you can compute the pitch. And once you know the pitch, you can drop a perpendicular to the floor and compute absolute z. Not the change in z, but you can compute absolute z from the center of the backpack to the floor. And guess what else is good about the fact that you compute absolute z? The errors in z do not have a chance to accumulate. So as you see, this kind of algorithms result in very good absolute z or global z values. So what's the uh, summary of this algorithm? Again, you use the top horizontal yaw scanner to give you delta x, delta y, delta yaw. Uh, you use the planarity assumption to give you absolute z. And then you use the orientation measurement unit to get delta roll and delta pitch. So you only have to run ICP once. So that's why it's called 1 times ICP plus OMS plus planar. Planar meaning we assume planar floors. You can also mix and match these algorithms, like I was saying. So if, if I walk on, on the, this, this is a three-dimensional plot of a path that we took. Uh, this is the uh, fourth floor of Quarry Hall and third floor. So here we're on a plane. Then these are the staircases, and this is on a plane again. So this, hy so this hybrid algorithm detects when we're in planar regions and switches to the one times ICP planar algorithm. And then uh, whenever we're not on a planar region, like the staircases, it switches over to the other best algorithm, 2 times ICP plus OMS, because we can't assume planar surfaces on staircases. And this is actually a slightly old 
uh, slide, we can we have made it work so that you know, as you come down the staircase, there's a little planar area before you go down the next set of staircases. It even detects that now pretty nicely. Okay, so that's the end of incremental localization. I talked about four algorithms, three times ICP, two times ICP, one time ICP, and then hybrid. Now I'm going to talk about um, loop closure, and uh, which allows us to do what we call global localization, not just change from one time to another, but globally, where am I kind of a thing. Uh, so what's the shortcoming of incremental localization? We already talked about it a little bit when we're talking about outdoor modeling. Uh, when you concatenate these incremental localization vectors, one after another, either in 2D or 3D, the error becomes unbounded. The errors accumulate over time. So the global error could be very large, even though incremental error is small. So the best way to look at it is this path. Uh, if you just concatenate the, the incremental localization values, uh, you get a path that goes eight meters up into the sky. And clearly, our operator didn't fly. I mean, our students are good, but they don't fly in the sky. In, in the, they can't jump eight meters up in the room. So uh, we have to find a way to correct for that. And before I got into the mechanism of explaining how we do that, uh, I want to spend a, a minute to talk about uh, uh, the approach we take, which is we build a graph G that has uh, vertices V and edges E. Uh, in this, so this is shown here. So uh, a node in this graph is a pose at a given time, right? So uh, at node 2, for example, it's the global pose, six degrees of freedom, at time instant 2. Right? And the edge between the two nodes is the incremental transformation, Tij, from node i to node j. So these T1, 2, T2, 3, T3, 4, T4, 5 are the incremental stuff we get from any of those four algorithms I just talked about. Right? So if you know where you start and you know the incremental transformation from T1 to T2, that takes you to absolute position at time 2. And then if you know the incremental transformation from time 2 to time 3, it tells you the absolute position and, and pose at time 3, etc. And the, the way to reduce the error is to what we call close the loop. In other words, revisit the same spot uh, during your acquisition in order to in, induce a cycle in this graph. So if I start here, go all the way down the hallway, I come back here. I'm revisiting the same spot. And when I do that, then I can compute a transformation from node 5 to node 1. And by doing so, I'm closing the loop or inducing a cycle in this graph. And, as, and then if I solve an optimization problem, which I'll talk about in just a second, I can reduce the error, uh, this error that makes me go all the way up into the sky. So how does loop closure work? So this is the same picture, but in a little bit more detail. I start at location 0, 0, walk around. This is an actual path. Come back here. I've actually come back to the same location, even though if I just concatenate the vectors, it tells me I came back to a different location. So if somehow magically, and it's not really magic, it's in the next slide, if I can discover that I'm revisiting the same location, then when I build this graph that's shown in the lower left, uh, I can put an arrow between node 10 and 1, connect these two things in building my graph by what we call closing the, the loop, and compute the, six, the same way as I compute incremental transformations between node 9 and 10, 8 and 9, and each of these by using by those four algorithms. I can also get the scans from node 10 and get the scans from, uh, from, from no, node 1, which corresponds to time 1, and do compute that incremental transformation, and therefore put an additional arrow here by, to close the loop. And when I do that, now there's a bit of an inconsistency, right? So I have to, I have to wiggle each of the absolute poses at each of these nodes a little bit uh, in order to make the whole thing consistent, and, and by do, so I do that by solving an optimization problem where I compute, I, change, I compute the absolute pose at each of the nodes such that this quantity is minimized, and the amount that I wiggle each of these poses at these nodes has to do with the covariance of the error at each node. It has to do with the degree of confidence I have in each of my local transformations. So it turns out that when I do those ICPs, do I not only want to compute the incremental the change in my position and angle, I also want to come up with a measure of confidence in that answer. And I, in this talk, I'm not going over how we do that, but that's shown by this covariance matrix sigma uh, here. Um, and so by solving this minimization problem, I can then adjust the absolute poses on each of these nodes so that I get a consistent answer. Yes. Going up and down the same hall, not going around a square or something. Correct. Well, uh, no, you can also go around a square. 
come back to the same position. As long as you revisit approximately the same location, you can play this game. So um, even when we did like the second floor of Quarry Hall, it's a donut hole, actually. We started at one end, right. went around, came back to the other end, and you can close the loop there. Yeah, it assumes you revisit the same location. That's all. Excuse me, sorry. Can you, wait, can you close the loop on the graph itself? Can you, can, you, can you close the loop on the graph itself without... Uh, what do you mean by that? Like, over there? Yeah, yeah. So what you do is, this, this plot here, it shows yeah. actual data. This shows the, the, the graph abstraction for it. So what you do is, you, you because you know this, this position is approximately the same as this position, you get the scans from this time instant the, and the scans from this time instant. Do a scan matching between those, 1XICP, 2XICP, whatever your favorite algorithm is. And then that causes an arrow to be added between node 1 and node 10. And then you shove it into this optimization algorithm, which is extremely fast. And there's well-known methods in the literature that solves it. And that refines each of the poses here. So then when I replot this, these two points coincide and go on top of each other. I reduce the error. I eliminated the error, if you will. Okay. And and this this plot down here shows you the the uh, visually shows you the size of the covariance matrix as we traverse along this path. So the big ellipsis shows that we have a lot of uncertainty, and the little circles show we have little uncertainty. And you can see that the, at the turns we generally have huge uncertainties because ICP has a lot of trouble. Yeah. Does the minimization equation start assuming that nine and two are relatively the same spot? And no, no. Both it, on? it only the only assumption is, and I'll tell you how we solve this problem just in one minute. The only assumption is that 10 and 1 are approximately, approximately the same location. OK, so here's the uh, summary of our localization algorithm. We estimate incremental transformations, uh, TIJs, and their associated covariances, sigma IJs, uh, both between adjacent nodes, that's incrementally over time, and also every time we detect a loop closure event. Uh, from that, we build a graph. And then in our particular example, we use uh, the Toro software from uh, from Burgard's group uh, in Germany to, to optimize that, and then we get a final estimated poser. So the only thing that so far I've shoved under the rug is how do I detect loop closures? How do I know I'm approximately the same place as I was before? And the answer is we use the camera, because we have cameras, and we're going to use the cameras at the end for texture mapping anyway, but we might as well use them for um, loop closure detection. Uh, so we, we use the FAPMAP technique, or a variation of FAPMAP technique that, that Newman and his colleagues at at Oxford came up with to generate a rank ordered list of candidate image pairs for potential loop closures. Uh, and then we compute the uh, probability of each image. The way it works is by using a Bayesian uh, inference framework and maximum likelihood framework. But in this set of pictures, you can see that if, you, if you're in the hallway at this point and then you walk down the hallway, blah, 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 you come back here, these two are approximately from the same location. I think, uh, yeah. When you say same location, do you mean same value-ish for all six of your coordinates? So you have to be like in the same place and also the same orientation? That's a very good point, and it gets clarified in just one second. For now, it's the same, approximately the same position and approximately the same orientation. So if I went down the hallway, came back here, I don't stop here. I also turn this way. Because I'm now assuming I only have one camera. Let's say I'm go the walls are here and here. I have one camera looking to the right. So it's looking to the right, it takes the pictures of these, 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 comes back here. I have to do that. It has to look at the same wall in the same position. But if you have double cameras, it only has to be the same position, and you'll see that it's not the same orientation. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I have till 2, right? Yeah. So we literally get cut off at 2, right? OK, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all these things. So this tells you what we did on top of Newman's algorithm in order to get his results and make it work for our situation. Basically, Newman comes up with the rank order list of image pairs that it thinks are loop closures. And then we have to further filter those out and process them by looking at their SIFT features and looking at other indicators in order to, to detect the true loop closure pa image pairs from that. I won't go into the details of it. Um, so let me just um, briefly just show you some some results for localization. Um, this shows the effect of loop closure. Basically, the, the black, so what, what you have on the, on, uh, here is the global position error, and what you have on the right is global rotation error. 
um, and the proposition we have x, y, z. For rotation, you have roll pitch y. And once again, global means in the global coordinate. I'm not worried about the, the error introduced from one time to the other. I'm worried about globally when I reconstruct my path and my pose, what is my error? And what you can imagine, if I start here and go all the way here, the global error at this point, for example, the global position error at this point, not only depends on the incremental position error on all the previous times before that point, it also depends on the global, uh, the incremental rotation errors from this point all the way to that point. So global position and global rotation errors are much more, are a very complex function of every, all the incremental position and error, uh, errors prior to getting to that point. Uh, so, so just because I have good position, incremental position error, it doesn't mean I have good, good global position errors. It's a lot more complicated than that. Anyway, so what, what, I'm, what I'm showing here is that if I do this loop closure stuff that I just talked about, my error is the black bars, which are low. Uh, and uh, if, I, if I don't do it, the error is this white bars, which are very high. So this loop closure and this, this refinement that I did because of loop closure actually works. And, and pictorially, that green path that we used to have going up into the sky without doing the loop closure comes all the way down and, and looks very close to the ground truth um, by, by doing this loop closure stuff. And you might be wondering, well, how do these four algorithms compare against each other? And here's one set of studies by operator one, another set of studies by operator two. Again, I have global position error, global rotation error, incremental position, incremental rotation. And I have it for X, Y, Z, yaw pitch roll, extensive study. But what I want you to walk away from is that the global position error, which is here in along the Z direction, is much, much smaller for the planar algorithm. So these different colors correspond to the four I incremental algorithms I just talked about. And the planar one is, is the one times ICP plus the OMS plus planar. Uh, it, it if, if you're in a planar region, you can get really low absolute Z errors, which is something I warned you about a few minutes ago. Uh, how about more complex environments? So it's in this picture, uh, in this slide, set one is just uh, flat on one floor. Uh, set two, three, and four are two stories. And, and these uh, red circles show you the positions of the loop closure error. So one loop closure here, sorry, positions of loop closure. So one loop closure here, uh, this gets matched to that, this gets matched to that, et cetera. You basically start here, you go traverse a bunch of things, and you come back to the same location. And uh, what we're showing in these plots is that just because we went up and down the stairs, the error didn't become too big. It's still quite acceptable. And the most interesting uh, data, perhaps, is in this table down here, which shows the path length on this column, and it shows the average position error on this column. So for data set four, which is shown here, which is the longest data set we have in this, in this slide, we, we, we traversed 142 meters, and we ended up with average position error of 43 centimeters. Uh, which is not that much worse than data set one, which didn't have any staircases, which we, it, it covered 68 meters and position error of 66, average position error of 66, 0.66 meters or 66 centimeters. So basically, there's not a huge penalty in going up and down the stairs. Things still work. And, and mind you, we use the 2x ICP algorithm for the staircases and, and, the, uh, and the 1x ICP here. So basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that um, 2x ICP doesn't per perform too much worse than 1x ICP. And this is a path for uh, three-story localization. The, the blue is so here's story one, story two, story three. Blue is uh, the open loop. And after we close the loop, it becomes very close to ground truth. So the ground truth from, from the Aplanex is, is the green. And our closed loop path is the red. And the open loop path before loop closure is blue. OK, so coming back to your comment, um, so far we, we were using just one camera, the left-facing camera for loop closure. So what that meant is that uh, to, to have a loop closure, we have to come to the same position and orientation. But if I have two cameras, right and left, uh, if I go down the hallway this way and keep taking pictures, by the time I rotate, the picture from this camera now matches the picture I took a second ago from this camera. So I can have a lot of loop closures. And when I get here, I don't necessarily have to turn I, I can still have a loop closure at the end uh, when I revisit the same location again. So um, this shows the picture here is that when you have two cameras and um, opposing cameras, one to the right, one to the left, I can have a lot more loop closures. Yeah? Do you ever experience any correct uh, loop closures? Maybe it's the same on two different We floors. do, and the, so the, step, the post processing step that I skipped is one way to get rid of it. And then this next slide is another way. That was a very good point. 
and some of the loop closure events are not quite good. And so what we do is cross-check and have a lot of checks and balances to make sure our data is consistent. So for example, uh, after we detect all these loop closures, we compute the transformations between the two points. And if the resulting transformation doesn't make the SIFT features in the two images at those time instances to line up correctly, we toss it out. Uh, we, also use, we, and we also use the superposition of the laser scans on top of the images in order to come up with checks and balances to make sure that these loop closures are good. So one good thing about having an abundance of sensors is that it allows you to have all these checks and balances that you wouldn't otherwise have. It makes the system more heavy, more expensive, more this, more that. But, but as you can see, each one of the sensors have multiple uses. Like the lasers are used both for localization and geometry building. The cameras are there for texture mapping. We might as well use them for loop closure, right? OK, so that uh, ends my discussion on loop closure and global localization. Now I'm going to talk about point cloud generation. Uh, and that's a piece of cake. By now, we know at each instant in time where we are and what the angle of the backpack is. So we can now correctly stack the vertical scans and build a point cloud, like it's shown here. Uh, and once you have the point cloud, uh, then this is an example of a color point cloud of, of, of third floor. We haven't built surfaces out of it. It's still a point cloud, but you can go to each point cloud and each point and associate a color based on your camera. Uh, this is the, the interior hallway. Again, the point cloud representing that, three-dimensional point cloud of that. Uh, this is a three-dimensional point cloud of a three-story scan we did. Story one, story two, story three or two-story, one, two. And this is the staircase point clouds. Um, so you can easily see the, the stairs um, from looking head on or, or up, up, uh, sideways, etc. There's an interactive video that goes with it, but I'll skip that in the interest of time. And uh, one more point is that uh, at some point, one of our sponsors asked us to make a, a non-backpack, but a system on, a, on wheels that we can roll. Uh, and for that, they gave us more money, so we bought better laser scanners. Uh, and, uh, and you can see the resulting point clouds. They look beautiful. Uh, the, the, if you're on a, on a system with wheels, it doesn't pitch and roll. It doesn't tip over. It doesn't roll over like a Jeep, for example. And so you get really clean point The localization problem is very easy to solve uh, and uh, nice pads. And this is the cubicle areas in our, in our building, which is really not as nice as what you got here. but. Um, anyway, so that's the end of point cloud generation. And now let me talk to surface, uh, a little bit about surface reconstruction. Uh, so you can have, uh, uh, you can say indoors have a lot of planar surfaces. Uh, assume the floor and ceiling are planar and horizontal, walls are planar and perpendicular to the floor. That's one approach. And the second approach is to do um, what we call scan line triangulation. Basically, uh, in, conf in, in surface reconstruction literature, if you're, because we know the order in which we got scans, one after another, there's a temporal order, there's a timestamp associated with each scan, and because each scan, within each scan, there's an order, uh, at which, uh, order in which the points arrive, there is an order in our point cloud. And so triangulating an ordered point cloud is an infinitely easier problem than an unordered point cloud. So what Matt Kahlberg, um, my student, did in, in 2008, he said, look, if these are successive scans and we know the order of the scans and the order within scans, then we can triangulate in a simple way, which is described in this paper, and get, get our answer. So generally speaking, this, this triangulation approach results in more geometric rich models because we're not just slapping planes everywhere, but it also has more artifacts. Um, I'll show you models based on both, but for now, let me just tell you a few more words about the plane uh, fitting algorithm. So we be basically, we use curvature analysis, PCA, principal component analysis, to, in order to come up with, with the normals for each of the points in the point cloud. And then once we have the normals, we can detect walls that are um, um, parallel to the YZ plane, walls that are parallel to the XZ plane, and, parallel, and those that are parallel to the XY plane. For example, the walls that are parallel to the XY plane are just the ceiling and the floor. And then once we collect, we call each of those structures. So for each structure, we can then analyze them and divide it into clusters. So we can separate the, the floor from the ceiling, for example, that's shown here. And then you can use RANSAC, uh, which I won't have time to go over, the technique in computer vision for removing outliers, to fit a plane to each cluster. And so this is the set of planes, for example, that we fit to the two-story model that I'll show you in just a second. So that's uh, the end of surface reconstruction. And now uh, let me say a few words about texture mapping. 
Uh, so th there's really three steps in texture mapping. First, we want to find candidate set of images and then filter out of those candidates as those that are undesirable because they're looking, for example, at a triangle at an oblique angle tangentially rather than head on or, or they're too far away, they don't have enough resolution, etc. And then from whatever that's left, from whatever set that's left, we want to pick the best image. So um, the filtering process is, is shown here and it's exactly what I just told you. If this is a triangle, it has a normal and the camera is looking in this direction, you want the, the, the direction of the uh, angle of the camera with respect to the normal not to be uh, too far off, and you want the distance not to be too far off. So that's how you filter. In terms of optimization, we uh, come up with a very simple um, um, uh, cost function. We look at 1 over distance times 1 minus the, um, uh, uh, I think this is the, uh, C, CI is the camera look vector, the direction that it's looking. So we look at both a combination of the angle that we're looking at and the distance in order to pick the best image from the candidate set. Uh, in, sorry, in order to, um, am, among all the candidates, to pick the best one that's, that we made for, for texture mapping that triangle. Uh, now the, the middle step, which is choosing the candidate set, is the hardest one and actually has the biggest effect. So uh, if, if you filter out a bunch of your, your your image is saying they're not good. You still have a, a, a you still have to choose, uh, sorry, before, the, the step one is one I haven't talked about. How do we pick the initial candidate set? That, that from, from there on we, we do step two and three. And, and in order to induce what we call neighborhood consistency, we want to first look at, consider all the images that were already used. So you say, you have a cache, you've already used these images to texture map the triangles you've encountered so far. So you do your best to do your texture mapping from that pool in order to make sure that you don't choose too many different images for painting neighboring triangles. Otherwise, you get this flickering, annoying uh, artifacts in your model. And if that doesn't work, uh, uh, then you consider images that have timestamp delta t of the last image that you ever used. And the reason for doing that is that if you pass by a wall twice, once going this way, once going the other way, you ideally, you, for two neighboring triangles, you want to use images that are temporally close to each other. Why? Because your localization is never perfect. There's error in the path. And if you use the image going down the hall this way um, for one triangle and the image going down the hall this way for the next triangle next to it five minutes that you pass by that same location five minutes later, that localization error makes the two uh, images not line up nicely. And then if finally all, the, all else breaks, then, then you look at all available images. So here's some examples of, uh, of models, uh, piecewise planar models uh, that uses this um, image mosaicing idea, uses image mosaicing. Uh, this is from outside looking. This is from inside looking. As you can see, because we fit planar model, the boxes that were sticking out got smooshed to the wall, right? So ideally what you want to do is after you do your planar modeling, all the points that didn't get modeled by the plane and are sticking out, you want to, like layers of onion, fit additional models to it, which we haven't done yet. Uh, here's an example of a model, not from planar models, but scanline triangulation. As you can see, there's more details. No boxes ever get squished to the walls because we're not assuming planarity. But it also has more artifacts. This is the same hallway when we look at the, down the hallway from the scanline triangulation. You can see there's irregularities here, etc. So in general, we have two kinds of artifacts in our, in, our mod, in our textured models. One is image is not lining up. So for example, you can see the, each of these stripes came from a different image. Uh, and this line is not getting lined up with this one. So this is because of localization. We, didn't, we weren't perfect in our localization. Uh, and the same thing here. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's also the, the illumination differences between our images. And that needs to be fixed as well. So the illumination difference can be easily done by doing some sort of a blending. And I won't go into the details of it, but basically from an image on the left, you can get image on the right. On the other hand, and, and you can also, the same blending or gain compensation allows you to go from an image that looks kind of uh, oscillates in intensity like this, something that's more smooth than I can. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll skip this in, in the interest of time, but textual misalignment and due to localization is a bigger problem. And fundamentally, the reason 
our localization is not good because we only use good enough for texture map models is because you only use laser and OMS in localizing, right? We never used images, and therefore we can't expect a resulting localization to be pixel accurate. If we really want the localization to be pixel accurate, you have to use images in a direct way in your localization step. So we, we've, this is an active area of research still for us. We've come up with three approaches to come up with pixel accurate localization. Um, and I'll go over all three of them in just uh, in very quickly. The, the first one is to say, look, we're building this Toro graph that we just talked about, this, this inner circle using laser scan matching. Why don't we just build additional arrows between the nodes of this graph because due to image matching. So match the image at this time against that and come up with this new transformation T1, 2 prime, shove all of that into Toro. Maybe that would, that would make the whole localized path a bit more pixel accurate. And you could do that. Um, it, it, locally, it works. It makes you know, this image to look like this, and things line up locally very well. But globally, it doesn't. It, it results, as a matter of practice, it results in gradual shifts in Z, makes our path go up in the sky, all those undesirable things. And you can see that in this, in this, uh, in this picture here. So locally, these pictures are lined up nicely. There's no misalignment. But gradually, as I walk from here to here, it goes up. And it's not so good. Uh, what we have found, um, yeah, I'll skip this also. The second approach that we've taken is, is image stitching. Basically, we use David Lowe's image sticking algorithm, stitching algorithm. And we said, look, we have a plane. We have a bunch of images. Just mosaic them together after we do some perspective correction on them. And so far, that has resulted in the best images. And why don't I uh, show you a video of this two-story model, for example, um, that that uh, that uses this approach. So this is a two-story model where we mosaiced, uh, we did planar fitting, and then we mosaiced images on top of the the planes. So you can still see a little bit of waviness uh, along, the, along the pictures on the wall, but we don't have that drastic go up in the air kind of Z artifact that I talked about earlier. And so now we're doing a virtual walkthrough along the walls and come down. Uh, it's not very clear in this screen. Uh, maybe in the video that eventually comes out, it's, it's a little bit better go in the, in the hallway, tunnel hallway, look to the right, look to the left. So this planar uh, uh, model fitting, so far we've only gotten it working for walls, and now we're working on fitting planes to the staircases. Again, you can think of it as layers of onion. You first come up with the major walls, and then with little surfaces, etc. cetera, with, 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 pla with little planes corresponding to the steps, one after another, et cetera. And then eventually you want to have a hybrid model. Some of the objects are, ju are just not planar. In which case, you, maybe you want to have a hybrid triangulation and planar model. This shows the fact that there's no staircases. It's looking down, and uh, if, if you jumped, you, you fall and die. In the model, you would, not in real world, right? OK. Um, moving on, uh, there's, there's a third approach that we're currently looking at, MRF formulation for lining things up, basically. Uh, think of it as a, as a labeling problem and then solve a Markov random field optimization using graph cut type of approach. Uh, we're still working on that. Um, I will show an interactive model in just a second if there's time. I, I want to um, talk about two little applications of this work to, to other areas. So, um, so far, what, what I've concentrated on is building an actual 3D model that you can spin, look around, and go inside tunnels, etc. Um, but there's another way to visualize this data, and that's called image-based rendering. How many of you have heard of it or know what it means? OK, so the idea is you store all your images on some storage device like a disk. But for all of our images, as the, due to the process of localization of the backpack, we have a pose associated with it. We know what the pose of the camera was when it took the picture, which way was it looking, and where it was. So uh, you can imagine uh, what image-based rendering does is it has an imaginary view, viewing eye in the room. 
And as that viewing eye points and looks at different directions, the right images get mosaic and get presented to the viewer. Right? So it gives you an illusion that you're in the room without ever being in the room, but it does so without building an explicit 3D model. It does so by stitching the right images, because we know the pose of the camera for all the images, as the viewer is looking at the right direction, at whatever direction, the correct images get stitched together to be presented to it in order to give an illusion of being in the room. That's called image-based rendering, right? And in doing so, we not only use the pose of the cameras, but we also use the fact that we, the, we have fitted planes to it. And the, the, the way we use the fitted planes is to deal with the occlusion process problem. So there's really three steps. We choose the best images. Uh, and best means you want to choose head-on and close-by images. Uh, and then we check for occlusions. And the way we do that, by taking advantage of the fact that we fit planes to our walls. And those planes allow us to figure out which, which image is not visible from what point. If it allows us to do occlusion detection quite easily. And then Mosaic can blend the images and, and show it to the viewer. So let me show you a video of that. Um, Here we go. So, uh, so there's no there's no model that we're interacting with here. It's, it's just the viewer looks at different directions and different places, and real time we montage and mosaic the right images and present it uh, because we know both the planes in the scene and be, uh, to avoid occlusions, and because we know the pose of all the pictures um, that we took. So all, what you're seeing is a synthetic view of the hallway. And we can look at the ceiling. We can look at the floor, and just the right images get produced to be, to be, to be presented to the user. You can imagine that it uh, allows you to virtually be in, a, in the room without ever being. OK. And finally, the last application, if we have time, uh, I want to talk about is uh, indoor uh, mobile augmented reality. So augmented reality refers to this business of pointing your viewfinder on your cell phone to a building and getting all the meta information. Your, your cell phone recognizes what building it is and gets the metadata information and presents it to you. Uh, and the reason you can do that is because uh, they do image matching. Uh, they have a geotag database of uh, all the uh, famous landmarks or all the buildings in, in a given street. And then you do image matching and figure out which building it is you're looking at, and you, then you recover the metadata. Uh, for indoor, as I said, there's no GPS, and so therefore coming out with the geotagged image database is difficult. But in, in what I just described in the indoor modeling, one of the nice byproducts or side products is a set of geotagged indoor imagery. So suppose you're in a mall, you've already done the indoor modeling of the mall, and you have a set of geotagged images for the, indo for the indoors. In, in other words, for each view in the mall, you know the pose of the camera as it took that picture. So if I now point my cell phone somewhere in the, in the mall, let's say at the, at the Gap store, it can quickly recognize where I am and, and tell me how do I get from you know, Gap to Ann Taylor or, or whatever. It can quickly localize me within that, that map. And, and all those games we were able to play with outdoor uh, augmented reality, we can play for indoors. And we've actually tried that on, on the set of images from second floor and fifth floor of Corey Hall, our, our building. And this is the uh, retrieval performance on the, on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the top end retrieved images. So here, uh, it, this point tells you that on the fifth floor of Corey Hall, uh, about 68% of the time, when we take a picture, 68% of the time, we can correctly tell you where that picture, which portion of second floor of Corey Hall it, it, it came from. And the reason this the um, fifth floor does worse than second floor is because fifth floor is only professor offices, which are extremely boring, as you can see in this picture. Whereas on the second floor is the, is the entrance to the building. There's all these nice posters and books and showcases, colorful, full of features and all that. Um, I'm going to uh, stop here. This is a list of uh, future work. We still need to work on uh, making our models uh, uh, have better surface reconstruction, reduce this texture misalignment, improve localization, come up with watertight models, and make these models easy to display. And um, uh, applications where this can be used are numerous. Architecture, plant and factory facilities, you want to do asset inventory tracking, 
uh, how, which equipments do I have? How big are they? Are they the same ones that I had last year? Or did some disappear? Had some piece of equipment be replaced by another one? Are these pipes the same as the pipes I had last year? Uh, useful for public areas like schools and hospitals. Um, as I said, firefighters, lo firefighters, law enforcement, first responders would love to have these models. Uh, public transportation places like airports, terminals, bus stations, um, music halls, stadiums, theaters, gaming and entertainment, and uh, underground mines and, and tunnels. And finally, if you still have more energy, here's a 3D model that you can interact with, uh, spin it around and, uh, uh, of the fourth floor of Corey Hall. And uh, if my student was here, he could go in, zoom in and go inside, but I forgot how to do that, I think. I think I'll, anyway, I'll play with it and I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah. I have a question for you. So, uh, have you heard of um, Stanford or MIT's work on uh, SLAM, so, uh, simultaneous location and mapping? Mm -hmm. um, could you uh, use the location data from just your laser scanners to be able to um, not have an inertial measurement unit that costs half a million dollars and just rely on that, um, or be able to use the stereoscopic vision um, to be able to generate point cloud data and get imagery data at the same time and be able to localize you within a room and be able to right. from that. So just to be clear, we're not using the half million dollar to generate these models, right? The HD9900 is only used to, to characterize our error. Hmm. So when I say OMS, or orientation measurement unit, I'm referring to a $500 inner sense unit. Right. So all of these models were generated just using lasers, cameras, and that $500 cheap unit. The, the expensive unit was just there for, for ground truthing and figuring out what the error is from that cheaper system. So in a sense, what we're doing uh, is a kind of SLAM algorithm. I didn't use the word SLAM. I have, a, I have a, not a student, a visiting scholar, not even a postdoc, a visiting scholar from Japan who is exactly doing the three-dimensional SLAM using our set of equipments, these various 2D scanners. So... Um, so what would so I, the, the, I, the, if I know which exact work you're talking about, I think what those guys are doing is recovering a map. Right. They're not building a complete texture 3D model. Right. Uh, so we're going one step beyond that. We're first doing the localization, which is the slam part, and then making a point cloud, and then texture mapping it, and creating an environment which you can then virtually interact with. Could you substitute a... Um uh, well thought out um, stereoscopic camera um, setup instead of laser scanners? Yeah, I get that question all the time. And the answer is you might be able to do that. My personal take on it is that vision is not ready uh, to, to produce robust answers in a sense that, I mean, I shouldn't say that so loud because Mark Polifis at UNC did that. Uh, but even when you talk to Mark, he can tell you grief stories about, about all of those. Uh, it w they, they work 80 or 90 percent of the time, but not 100. Uh, and so, for example, in that Toro graphs I just told you, uh, if you just remove the links from laser and put camera, 70, 80 percent of the time they're correct as compared to the ground truth from a Planex. Uh, 20 or 30 percent they're wrong, and the paths that you get are wild. They're everywhere. So that, it, it takes even like one or two bad poses to poison the well and make your overall path become very bad. When, you, when you're concatenating a bunch of localizations to build the big path, each one, each one, each wrong one, especially if it happens early enough in your path, could throw a, make the end destination very, very wrong. So, and I, I person, my, it's my personal bias, but I don't think vision is ready to produce that 100% answers, and I think lasers are. Uh, you don't quite get the same, uh, uh, the same kind of uh, errors with laser as you can with vision. So, theoretically, academically, yes. Practically, I think not. Not yet. Not yet. Good, good piece. Yeah. Um, how heavy did you say the backpack system was? Like, all of it? Without the ground truth, uh, it's about 30 pounds. With the ground truth, it's 60 pounds. So it doubles our weight. And mm. right. You have any plans to make it um, Lighter, I, I suppose. It, it yeah. seems like it'd be a nice system to attach to a, a quadcopter or something. Yeah, what happens is that I was, I don't know who I was, ex oh, I was explaining to Greg last night. We, we, because it's our first prototype, we went overboard, we have steel right. thing. We didn't, we, not a, 
I mean, another example is that when we, when we designed it, our cameras were doing 30 frames a second, and now they're doing like three frames a second. We realized it was an overkill. People don't walk that fast, you know. Uh, there's no need. To, even with three frames a second, there's like 95% overlap between our images. So, uh, and you know, 12 pounds of that 30 pounds is the, is the laptop because it has a RAID system. We, do, we don't even need that. This is, you know, way overkill. But when you're building your, your prototype, you don't know what you're at, up against, so you just overbear it. Yeah. So I, I think we can end up with a 10 to 15 pound system uh, eventually. It'd be interesting if you could attach that kind of system to um, helicopters or portable. Mm -hmm. The large helicopters, and you have multiple vehicles mm -hmm. able to go out. Right. Well, I mean, Google uh, Earth, when they licensed our stuff, they put the laser scans and everything on top of trucks. I, I, have you seen those driving in your? Yeah, you must have. Right. They do them on bicycles too. Yeah, they do it on bicycles. Uh, again, the the bicycle has some pitch uh, or some roll, but not too much. So it's, it's it's actually tricycle. The ones that I've seen. Yeah. So. Right. Uh, this allows you to go into tight spaces. That actually, PG&E wants to us, <laughs> why don't we have a zip line in our factory? And you hang your backpack off the zip line, and it goes from one end to the other. And so, great. Uh, do right, two questions. One, uh, did you ever look at the errors from just using the accelerometer IME output for dead reckoning? Uh, mm -hmm. Only for localization. I understand you need the Huge laser. errors. The yaws are so bad. Okay. It's well, unusable. The, the magnetic sensor, yes, but like the the accelerometer will still be okay. We're looking. Errors. No, we're looking into that. So we're in the process of building like a Kalman filter, particle filtering framework, and I've finally gotten my student. Nick, you know the guy in the video who said the best human operator or the best brain. I forgot the, the Nick Corso. He's finally now looking at that. Okay. Correct. Second question was: uh, Ever played with the connect depth images with the patterns uh -huh. uh, for short range? Yeah. Um, so that's another comment I got when I spoke at ICME last July in Barcelona. Um, so you know the Microsoft guys were almost all there, and and Uke Gupta made an interesting comment. He said, "The connect does is a short range. You know, our laser scanners are 40 meters range. The connect has four meters range, right?" said, ours is good for modeling one room. Yours is good for modeling hallways and big things. Uh, so they complement each other nicely. I thought that was an interesting comment. But yeah, certainly Connect has revolutionized and it produced a lot of enthusiasm. The thing about it is that it is noisy and it has a short range. Uh, but if you play lots of games, you could make nice models off of it. I've been contacted to review at least 10 papers since it came out in January for indoor modeling. Uh, so a lot of activities there. Yeah. But they also are using just imagery and uh, IR point clouds. So. Oh, IR is active. Right. It's, it's very. If they didn't use that IR projector, they would never be able to get the point cloud. Correct. For sure. But Correct. So, so coming back to your question, can we get away with stereo vision only? No. <laughs> I think the main reason there is work is exactly that IR projector. Yeah. I, I think. Uh, yeah. So, so here we finally have a computer vision, you know, mass market computer vision product, and it's not just vision; it's active vision. It's not passive vision. It's active vision. Right? Yeah. And it, you're right. It's, it's not even two fifty. It's one fifty. I but thought it was one fifty. Uh, well, but it's still using computer onboard computer processing to do all of that. Um, sure, sure. That that I, I don't dispute that. Right. But but the point is, it's not passive vision. Right. Uh, one, one more. One more yeah, I was just curious about the uh, processing time mm -hmm. for the three D models. Is it like, uh, like a week or? Well, the localization is extremely fast. Ten minutes. Uh, or five minutes. It's, it's shorter than the run, the walk time, right? Uh, the thing that consumes a lot of time, because we haven't optimized it, is like we collect all the images, undistorting it takes four hours. Uh, undistorting the images from you get from a 10 minute walk is four hours. Computing SIFT features, it could be done much faster, but we just downloaded it, whatever what was on David Lowe's web page, and ran it, and that's for another four hours. But once you do those steps, uh, the, the image loop closure is another couple of hours, but everything else is fast. Texture mapping is also minutes. The, the three big things are undistortion, SIF feature detection, and loop closure. Undistortion and SIF feature detection is something that everybody does. I'm sure there's faster codes and GPUs we can run and get it down fast. The loop closure is not so much, and that's an area we should probably spend time. All right, let's take our speaker again. Thank you. Maybe try shift versus rolling. Oh, yeah.